Welcome to E-Commerce Insiders, a journey to success, where we dive deep into the heart of e-commerce, uncovering the secrets behind successful online stores and the entrepreneurs who run them. Hosted by Chris Morano, each episode includes insights, strategies, and inspirational stories designed to guide e-commerce store owners on their journey to building remarkable brands. Whether you're starting up or scaling up, we're here to light the way, sharing the experiences of those who have made their mark. Let's get ready to build your dream brand together. Welcome to another episode of E-Commerce Insiders, The Journey to Success, where we dive deep into the stories from brand owners to help bring you the information needed to scale your brand. In today's episode, we have the co-founder of BusterBox.com, Gary Redman. We discuss Gary's adventure in the industry, which is a rich tale of innovation, strategic thinking, and perseverance. Throughout our conversation, we explore the nuts and bolts of adopting a subscription-based e-commerce model from the critical financial aspects and performance metrics that have guided Buster Box's journey to the unique challenges they faced along the way. Let's get into the episode. Hey, Gary, welcome to the show, E-Commerce Insiders, Journey to Success. Um, can't wait for you to share your information, your story with our listeners. Really appreciate you coming on the show today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So before we get into what your business is, can you share a little bit about who you are and, and how you got started in the online digital world? Yeah. So um, my name is Gary Redmond. I'm the co-founder of BusterBox.com, which is a subscription e-commerce brand that serves mainly the UK and Irish markets. We launched a business in early 2016. So we're going just over eight years now. Um, we pretty much we were three of us are co-founders we're all childhood friends my two co-founders Liam Brennan and Paul Carrick we know each other like 20 years we're almost like brothers we even barely ever fight in the business at all um, and we kind of came together we just saw the subscription box industry starting to really take off around um, 2015 2016 time we saw bark box in the US which I'm sure people are familiar with and we thought really no one is doing that in Ireland um, and we launched a business in Ireland 2016 but pretty quickly we realized how small Ireland was so we launched it into the UK, and most of our growth since then has been in the UK market. That's awesome. So it's interesting, you know, with the focus on the subscription model first, I find that a lot of e-com businesses have their direct-to-consumer approach, and they're trying to figure out the subscription model where you guys st started right there. Um, was that a direct strategic thinking it was when we launched the business and um, like we, we didn't really have much prior business experience whatsoever. <clears throat> we just literally saw what appeared on the outside to be a very successful business in, in Bark Box and Glossy Box and Dollar Shave Club. And that's just kind of what they were doing. We didn't really make a conscious choice to go subscription versus straight e-commerce. But obviously, having been in the industry for a long time now, it, yeah, it is interesting because it's kind of hard to do both successfully. And what we find is that you can kind of do one or the other successfully. And um, I, I could talk to you about later on, maybe about how our model works and we have the subscription kind of first, but um, yeah. That's amazing. It, it, there's so many advantages to the subscription model um, and I'm sure more disadvantages as well that I'd love to get into. So as you guys were coming up with this idea, how did you choose Buster Box? Like how did the pet dog category come into play so my two i was actually living in canada at the time i moved over to, to, to toronto i live in dublin now and have grown up here but i was living over there and my two childhood friends as i said they they just saw the subscription box and they were kind of like back and forth between doing a gym box or a dog box but they both had dogs i didn't have a dog at the time and they just saw saw bark box as i said and they said what kind of suits us better is to go with dogs um, and that's kind of how it just came about. It was it was pretty pretty simple, just kind of modeling what works. That's amazing. Um, I think you guys probably picked the correct one, knowing uh, I myself have a dog, have had dogs my whole life. I'm way more inclined to purchase something for my dog than myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. So as you guys were planning this all out, um, and two other co-founders with friends, um, interestingly enough, I just spoke with another brand owner last week who, who's a family business. How are you able to separate somewhat of that business side of the relationship to that friendship side? And do you guys all have your own verticals that you focus on? Yeah. So firstly, like we, 
we are still really good friends, which is great. Like we we can go down to the local pub here in Ireland, like we did last Thursday, um, and we still we do talk about business when it's just the three of us. But like when we have other people with us, particularly if it's like one other person, we try not to bore them. Um, but in the business, in the business, we have our own distinct roles. I kind of focus more on the investor sort of finance kind of stuff. Liam is um is does more of the, the pay per click ads and the marketing and things like that. And Paul uh, focuses on the product and the sourcing and logistics. So we kind of all have our own separate little places. I do help out with email marketing as well. Um, but yeah, so we kind of all, we can all come together on calls and make decisions together. We're all pretty, we're almost the same person. We grew up together. We know exactly what we want and everybody's as committed as the other. So it's not really too hard to make decisions. Um, but yeah, we kind of try and not step on each other's toes either. That's awesome. So having those three verticals and knowing like the financial side of e-commerce, a lot of people in the beginning miss that side of it, understanding variable costs, your margins, you know, product delivery costs. How much of that has played a, a factor in Buster Box? So we actually, we were talking with a couple of brands about possibly acquiring us this year and it actually opened up kind of a, a bit of a blind spot to us in terms of what we're really good at, and it's probably the same for a lot of a lot of people listening, is that you're you're really good at your your marketing and your branding and your ads and things like that. But to be honest, sometimes your your the boring side of the business, as I call it, can kind of get left behind. So management accounts, going over everything, costs, and all that sort of stuff. Like we would have really really uh, clear visibility on our like metrics, but our actual mm-hmm. bank account and accounts and stuff like that. Or something that we're lagging behind, but we really learned a big lesson last year because when you are going to to sell the company or run or taking an investment, that's kind of pretty much the only thing that people care about. So, um, yeah, it took a long time going back and forth with our accountant and kind of putting setting in place processes to kind of manage invoices and all that. But yeah, it's certainly been a challenge, but I think we're in a better place this year. That's awesome. What were some of, the, if you don't mind sharing, what were some of the kind of key indicators or, or KPIs in terms of e-commerce, in terms of, you know, some people will put inventory as a cog, which they most likely should not do. That's an asset. Um, what were some of the things that you might be able to share with our audience when looking at um, the financial side of the business that they should be aware of as they're either looking to bring on capital or just have a solid foundation from the financial side? Yeah, I guess um, just tracking things as well as you can and making sure that you understand why your, where your costs are driven from. Obviously, marketing is is a variable cost, but particularly for a subscription box business, it doesn't it doesn't go away. You can't turn off your ads uh, because if you have your <clears throat> your customers are churning <clears throat> your ads, your marketing cost kind of almost becomes a becomes a almost fixed cost. Not fixed cost, but it, it never, it's it's not that variable. Pretty much, you can only go up. Correct. Um, because we have like our customer churn. So that's something to be aware of and figuring out your contribution margin. So we would figure out the gross margin, but also have to factor in like for us to even remain at the same revenue where that we are at right now. When you factor in our customer churn, like there's a certain amount of money we have to spend at a certain customer acquisition cost to even stay at the same revenue next month. So that's something to be aware of if you're in the subscription game. Yeah, those uh, contribution margin, it's a kind of buzzword going on in the industry, especially with the reduction of attribution across these platforms. Is What are these benchmark KPIs that you really need to be tracking? Um, even new customer acquisition costs, right? Because if you have churn, you have your lifetime value. Um, are you able to, from a marketing and finance side of things, in calculating your lifetime value, have you established your customer acquisition cost? Are you at a loss on that first purchase based on your LTV? Yeah, so we would always run an offer on the first box, whether that be a free gift or a discount or sometimes a combination of both. But what we do is we have commitment terms. So a customer, in order to get the offers that we run, we only run them on our six or 12 month subscriptions, very similar model to Barkbox in the US. So we know that on average, the lifetime value on the customers who sign up for six or 12 month subscriptions is going to be at least three and a half times what it costs us to acquire that customer. Now, sometimes we end up going quite aggressive with our offer. And the reason is, um, if you think about like, if you're getting 10 customers a day or, or 50 customers a day uh, on one offer, but you, you know, it's quite an expensive offer to run. For example, we're doing a discount and a free gift. If you remove the discount, like you might have a better you might, it might be more profitable for the business side, side, but 
ends up increasing your CAC and reducing your volume. So you kind of end up just giving more money to Mark Zuckerberg. So we got, mm. we're always trying to balance like how many customers we can get and, and keeping our volume up so we hit the same revenue figures next month. But yeah, like especially in 2024 and 2023, you know, we are getting quite aggressive with our offers and it is, it is a, a, I mean, it's, it's difficult to maintain a profitable lifetime value, but we're somehow managing it. Yeah, beautiful. And I and you mentioned you have another partner that that handles email. I'm sure for subscription uh, a, a subscription based model that becomes pivotal. Is that accurate? Yeah, so I manage the email. Liam does the 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 the, the pay per click ads and Facebook ads with it, with our email. Yeah, we use it a lot for acquisition. Um, we we like really really rely on our email list. It gets up to thirty, sometimes forty percent of our sales in a given month. So it really helps to reduce that acquisition cost. But the interesting thing is that different to maybe a straight e-commerce business we kind of only have one product that we have like one front-end product so we have to try and say the same thing in a million different ways that's why the offers mm. become key and being able to send different emails different angles different offers and not kind of saying the same thing over and over and then with the when the customers have been acquired we do a lot in terms of gathering feedback you know especially if they've churned or when they've just signed up we ask them kind of a lot of information so we can learn about who they are and why they signed up Another thing we do with email is we do a lot of reactivation. So like people, especially in 2023, we realize like customers are harder to come by. People are more more uh, tight with their money. So like we've got 50,000 past lapsed customers who signed up at one point. So what we did was we went through and we basically sorted out who, who'd actually paid more than six times, which means we classify them as a good customer, not someone who just signed up for one box. And we really started to do reactivation campaigns through emails and through even uh, postcards to their to their door. So that was actually a pretty interesting thing to find out that we did actually bring a lot of people back. Yeah, that's super important. I mean, I, kudos to you guys for for thinking that way because you already paid for that customer. Mm-hmm. So how can you increase the value of a certain customer without having to spend more money? Mm-hmm. Um, so kudos to you guys. Now, for our listeners, why don't you tell them a little bit about the history of uh, Buster Box? Really, I know eight years now in business, you guys are at fantastic revenue numbers. Um Give us the the rundown of what the history looks like before we keep nerding out over numbers and, and confusing everybody. Yeah, I mean, I guess the important thing to know for people who may be in the beginning stages is we had absolutely no idea what we were doing in the beginning um, and did not really figure it out for many years. Um, we ended up on Dragon's Den, which is the, the Irish version of Shark Tank in the US. That was in 2017. We, we ended up getting offers from that. We ended up kind of getting a good segment on TV. We didn't end up taking the offer behind the scenes because it wasn't really valuing our company to where we wanted, but we kind of did a bit of a, a bit of a hack. And the hack is if you go in and ask for a lot of money, technically they have to give it to you. So what we did was we wanted to make sure that we at least got an offer, which means we would get a full segment on TV. So we went in and only asked for like 20,000 euro, which was really small. And like they kind of thought they would just maybe take a chance on us. So we ended up getting two offers, which means we got the TV slot and we kind of didn't really ever intend to take the money. So that was a pretty good thing to do. And that, that was the one thing that, get, that gave us, Ireland is a pretty small country. So compared to someone going out on Shark Tank, it didn't actually explode the business, but it gave us a lot of credibility. Um, and mm-hmm. people kind of believed in us a little bit more after that and had heard of us before. So that was in 2017. Um, 2018, we used to be called Scooby Box. And you know where this is going. Basically, we got a letter about that thick from Warner Brothers one day. We were like two years, two and a half years in business. And we had to basically change our name. Um, we were broke and we had to pay $2,000 for the domain name busterbox.com had to go on a payment plan and yeah like two and a half years in things were going pretty hard and we were losing money and we had to essentially almost start the business again so we've had our fair share of challenges and um, another I suppose a good a, a peak was actually in COVID so right before COVID we had about two and a half thousand subscribers and then within four months from March to July 2020 we ended up at eight and a half thousand and then we, we actually crossed the 10,000 mark in 2021 as well. So, yeah, it was it was a crazy time in the business because just a uniquely perfect time, as people obviously are aware, um, from for, for e-commerce businesses, people at home and, and whatever. But that was a pretty good one. And then since then, we've kind of, we've been doing a lot of kind of, in, well, not a lot of, but we got a little bit of investment over the last eight years. But in 2023, obviously, you know, everybody's intention, intentions shifted from, growth at all costs to profitability. We actually turned a profit right. last year and we're profitable at the moment. So we think we did pretty well to go from one extreme to the other. So that's kind of where we are now. As I said, we nearly sold the business last year. We will be interested in selling it on. 
but uh, we just wanted to wait and make sure we got the right price for it. Yeah, it's it's, a, it's perfect. It's so funny because COVID was just that catalyst for e-com brands. Um, but to your point, free money is is hard to you know turn away. And now, as everything has tightened up across the world, um, everybody is focused on kind of like you said those contribution margins, the new customer acquisition costs, those things. Because when you do not have a cash flow all the time of new money coming in from investment or capital, uh, it makes you really identify what are those key metrics we do need to be focused on. Mm -hmm. If you are looking for a community of fellow e-commerce store owners who you can bounce ideas off of and learn from and answer questions and just be around like-minded people, join our private Facebook group, E-Commerce Insiders where you'll be able to learn from fellow store owners and also be able to provide insights. Join our private Facebook group. There's a link in the show notes below, or just go on Facebook and search e-commerce insiders. It is a private group, so you will have to answer three very easy questions. Also, if you have any intention of selling anything, this group is not for you. Our goal is to provide as much value as possible to the community, not sell anything. Look forward to seeing you there. So from a, a fulfillment manufacturing side, can you walk us through how you guys are putting together these boxes? What yeah. that looks like? Do you have the inventory on hand at all times? Um, walk us through what that whole process looks like. Yeah, so we have a warehouse in Northern Ireland. Um, and the way that works is that's part of the UK, which means if you obviously we had Brexit in, in Europe over here. So I'm sure people are familiar if they're if they're in the UK market. So the good thing about having it in Northern Ireland is there's no duty when you're no import duties when you're sending it to the UK or to the Republic of Ireland. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a unique place for us to have our warehouse. So that's really good. So we have it there and we basically we come up with teams, team ideas and um, you know we have like a viking team we had recently we had back to the future dinosaurs we kind of always try and keep it interesting again very similar to bark box they're the leaders um, in the industry we go to uh, factories in china and we give them our designs our spec and then basically they produce the toys for us they're shipped into northern ireland and then in the in the warehouse in northern ireland we have a fulfillment company and uh, like an outsourced fulfillment and they pack the boxes first and ship us ship them down to northern down to the republic and over to the uk so um, for for a long time, we had to be involved in the fulfillment, but thankfully for the last couple of years, it's been outsourced and it's been a, a very big uh, weight off our shoulders, yeah. Awesome. Now, are you guys able to – so you're doing new boxes all the time. So is it a constant evolution of the planning side of the business? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just making sure that the customers – we keep it fresh for the customers and we always – we won't send you a box that you've generally received before, really, ever – so yeah, we just need to obviously keep our forecasting in check. We we kind of tend to um, be a bit pessimistic with our forecasting because one of the big problems, particularly when you're ordering from China, is being stuck with a lot of stock. So we do have local suppliers that we can use for smaller runs and smaller smaller kind of orders of toys and treats. So yeah, we kind of try and keep it keep it as close as possible to uh, where we are and at the subscriber subscriber level right now. That's amazing. So on average, how many subscribers are you shipping out to every month? Uh, just under 10,000. Wow. So you guys, how many products are within each box? So the standard box has five items, which is two toys and three treats. We do have an upsell uh, on our website where you can add an extra toy, which is uh, three toys and three treats. Um, and we also do a lot of sort of add to box and add ons where customers can leverage the monthly delivery. We can send them emails marketing like a particular product or maybe even a more expensive thing like a dog bed. We won't charge them any extra for shipping. So we try and say, you know, we'll make it more convenient for you. So there's not really much ways we can we can compete with Amazon if they're going to give, right. give things with free shipping and probably a better price than we can. But the one thing we can do is make it more convenient. If you've already got a delivery coming, you can add and you can you can add new things into it and get things that your dog liked before. Genius. It's amazing. So it's just it's wild to think about you're shipping fifty thousand single products per month mm -hmm. across to ten thousand customers. So when you guys were doing the fulfillment, if if somebody's not working with a three PL or a fulfillment facility, 
what was it like trying to organize the shipping of to even 2000 customers knowing that there's a minimum of five products per box every month yeah it goes deeper than that so it's a bit of a nightmare to be honest but basically we would have a standard box and a standard box is if you come onto the website and you are you know you're happy enough with the first box and that and that's fine you continue on that one but what will happen is a lot of customers will email in or get in contact with us and say oh my dog didn't like that treat he's allergic to this Hmm. or he doesn't like these kind of toys and then what we have is like the extra items so we basically have, we would always try and give customers what they want because otherwise they're just mm-hmm. going to churn and it's just going to hurt right. the business. So then what you have is you have the standard boxes and that takes a lot of time to pack five items, pack them up, label them. But then we actually have almost personalized boxes, not totally, but some like there's a certain level of, okay, these people want strong toys and they're a bit easy to do in, in kind of one run. But then you come down to like literally there's individual customers who need to get individual things and that adds like an extra an extra like 20% onto the fulfillment, even though it was only for maybe a thousand customers. So it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult enough. And yeah, I, we have experience because we used to do it ourselves. But um, I mean, it's all about keeping the customers happy because it's like the churn rate goes out of control, then you're not kind of spending money for nothing. Yeah, it's, that's amazing. Um, super interesting. So from a, a kind of nerding out a little bit from a developer standpoint, what platforms are you, what platform are you currently using for BusterBox? So we have the front end of the web website on WordPress, but we use a subscription platform called Subly. And it's okay. really, really good. It's got a lot of features, powerful features for subscriptions and automations. And we ended up actually getting quite friendly with the owner of Subly. He, he's from Scotland and we're from Ireland. So um, we ended up kind of doing a bit of a, not a joint venture, but we, we, we helped to develop the platform and we paid for some of the features that other people now use in Subly because we needed them in our business at the time. So mm. um, we've kind of been, been like yin and yang like that. So it's been really good. That's awesome. So from the custom customization standpoint, or is the customer from the front end, once they order, are they able to add those variables um, automatically based on the needs of their pet, essentially? So on the front end, we have a sign up flow. So rather than a traditional e-commerce website, when you go to busterbox.com and you click get started, we'll bring you to a simple survey that will ask you questions about your dog. And in the middle of that survey, we ask you for your email which is really, really effective for capturing emails. We get like a 30% plus conversion rate traffic to email list. And then after that, like in, in the survey, we ask you what's your dog's name, size, uh, birthday and breed. And we use some of the information to basically deliver you a personalized box depending on your dog size and breed. And then if they continue, they complete the order. The way it works, as I said, it's it's more if they're unhappy with the, with the delivery or they have any issues particular to their own dog, they contact us and then we'll personalize further from there. Wow, that's amazing. So it's all about customer satisfaction. How are you guys taking all this information? One of the things we find uh, a lot is that we all are able to access so much data now across the platforms and Meta and Clavio and whichever email provider you're using. How are you guys finding or what are you doing to aggregate all that data? How are you using it effectively and what's that process look like? Yeah, so our, our subscription data, we use a tool called Chart Mogul, which is a really good tool. It's actually built for SaaS products, but it's it's quite good for the subscription as well. So we can see our churn, our lifetime value. We can see our cohorts on the different offers that we run. So it's that that's good for our subscription metrics. Um, we have, like, we do a lot of surveys as well. Actually, a pretty pretty interesting thing I did was I downloaded, like, something like 8,000 survey responses from SurveyMonkey recently, and I used ChatGPT's um, data analyst tool, and I kind of like uploaded the survey responses and like tell me that, you know, the main the main reasons why people are churning or the main reasons why people are signing up and actually spat out a pretty good report. So that's a good tip if you're if you're kind of got a lot of survey responses. Um, and yeah, other than that, we have our orders and stuff, which we which we have through our order management system. But um, yeah, pretty good one to use the chat GPT data analyst tool. That's an amazing hack. That, that is the pro hack right there. Mm. It's interesting. I mean, a tool that was just released, when did it come out? January of last year, 2023, that I think if you're in e-commerce, really any tech industry, it's become part of the daily workflow. I can't remember anything that has came out in the last 15 years that had such an immediate impact on how we all uh, work almost. Mm. Yeah, very quick adoption, yeah. That's amazing. So then let me ask you a question. You mentioned that you, in order to 
get some of the customers back that, that churned, um, you guys tried direct mail. I would love to talk a little bit about how that came into fruition and then we can get further into the results if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, it was just it's just being very, very simple with everything like go, go go and look at all these past customers who had churned. Um again, we sorted them by people who we felt were a good customer. Like someone who gonna is gonna come in and I mean, look, some people are not happy with the first box and that's totally fine, but when you run offers on your on, on, on your subscriptions you are going to attract people who only want to get the offer and have no intention of continuing. So we kind of avoided people who didn't uh, stay for at least six months because, as I said, like it, it, our offers are only run on the six or 12 month subscription. So if you didn't even complete a six month subscription, it's not that we don't like you or maybe you just didn't like us, but like, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to give you another gift or another reactivation offer for you to do, to do the same thing again. So right. essentially once we sorted out who those customers were, um, we just got in contact with a company and uh, I can't remember the name of the company and we just designed a leaflet and one, one other important thing we did was we actually gave a cheaper price on the box per box for, for them to re- return and we also gave a really good offer we actually gave them a free box to, re- to return and we gave them a, a cheaper price ongoing so it was a really really good deal and like you said before it's always cheaper to reactivate a past customer, particularly someone who you know had stayed for at least six months than it is to go out to Facebook and find someone new who might only stay for one month as well. So we were a bit more generous with our reactivation offer. And what was the tracking implementation that you used to ensure that, hey, like this piece of mail activated a new customer? So we had a separate landing page and we had separate subscription products, which were named reactivate. So when customers Mm -hmm. signed up, we could see the effectiveness of of the reactivation campaign. That's amazing. And what were those results? I wouldn't have them to hand, but it was effective. And we got a we got we got several hundred customers to sign back up. And particularly in 2023, that was actually quite uh, quite a good result. I think we might have got over 500, um, which from 40, 50 thousand, like maybe that's well, um, not sure in the exact conversion rate there. It's probably a small enough conversion rate, but. Uh, it did make it did make a big difference and customers we found that when they came back particularly because we were giving them a better price they actually stayed longer so a lot of them people are actually still actually still subscribed so again like you know you're give, we couldn't really afford to drop our prices on the front end but for a reactivation offer you're better off to be getting like 20 pounds off someone you know reactivating zero to 20 pounds than just having zero you know so right. and that was an interesting thing is that when they actually came back they were much more likely to stay that's it's it's fantastic. That's that's amazing little case that you guys put together there. How did the direct mail was that just simply hey we know their address we know their names this is the easiest and most potentially effective um, use case for this platform. Yeah, I mean we have we have their SMS number. We did a few SMS blasts. Email is email. It's great. It's scalable, but it's you know it's not necessarily open by everybody who reads it. Whereas direct mail, it's much more likely to actually be received and obviously uh, opened by the customer. So we, we did personalize the leaflet as well. It had their dog's name on it, which was information we captured uh, from our sign-up flow. So yeah, it was it was quite effective. Um, the, the only thing about it was after we'd done it maybe three or four times, it kind of became less and less effective as with everything because we would have mm-hmm. kind of burned through the, the people who were actually going to sign up and re-sign up. So. That's awesome. It's interesting when you hear about online businesses shifting to an offline model. Um, I spoke with actually another pet uh, food company a few weeks back who has 50% of their their business coming through um, uh, retail and not major retail, independent retailers of dog food. I mean, mm-hmm. and you're saying, you know, it in terms of bootstrapping businesses, it costs nothing to go knock on doors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and way less than acquiring new customers on Facebook or Instagram. Mm-hmm. How have you guys seen over the evolution of the last few years, especially on the digital side, um, how have you seen a shift in customer acquisition costs? So we we just try to leverage as much as we can through our email list, through SMS. Like we're we're really good at doing one thing, and that's making sure we hit at least hit our hit our subscriber numbers. That sometimes can end up in a bit of a desperation towards the end of the month. And that might be doing something like a more aggressive offer. Um, but when you when you add it all up, the fact that we used to be able to give like just a free gift, 
and then you would get a customer acquisition cost of around 25 to 30 euro lifetime value of a couple of hundred so we were making some good money on it but now it's kind of like we have to give a discount and a free gift we kind of maintain the same cac on facebook but the gift that we have we have to get more generous with our gifts so that's definitely caused an increase particularly in the uk market like it's not even so bad in Ireland. I'm not sure about the US. I'm sure it's up, it's up and down. But the UK market is quite challenging at the moment because of, you know, they've, they've, they've left the EU. They had the Ukraine war. They have their own issues with, with, with inflation and uh, interest rates. So, yeah, we we're, we live in Ireland, but we serve the UK. So sometimes we can forget that. But certainly it's been more difficult to acquire customers. I'm sure everyone listening will be familiar. Yeah, it, it definitely has been. I think the challenge has been um, – acquisition costs and then just optimizing for these platforms and mm-hmm. unfortunately it seems like you have to be launching more creative launching new tests launching more than we used to um are you guys finding that as well in in ireland and the uk yeah we have to we, we refresh the creatives really regularly as well um and yeah like it's just it's just been more work for the same or less results which is just just the way it is at the moment yeah I couldn't have said it better myself. That is exactly as it seems to be doing more for the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, so from um, the creative standpoint and the branding, busterbox.com, you guys have done a fantastic job. So it, it screams, we know what we're doing and this is what we do extremely well. Um, I know you're on more of the finance and investment side of the business. Can you talk a little bit about how the three of you were able to create this vision and how were you able to essentially bring it to life? Yeah, I mean, look, we have to give a shout out to BarkBox. They're a very similar business to what we are, much more resources. So we don't expect to be competing with them or doing better than them. But like, I mean, a tip for people is to we don't overtly copy what they do, but we certainly model their own their own success for our, for our own marketing, right? So we we have all our own images, our own photo shoots, our own logos, our own designs, and everything. But we are taking inspiration from other businesses that are doing something similar to us, not just Sparkbox, but other subscription box businesses. You know, we're looking at what offers they're doing, what branding they have, and particularly like for the for the for the website and the color scheme, we actually use an agency. They're called Blackbird Marketing. They're really really good. Um, and yeah, like we're not, I'm not very good at design and the three co-founders are not good at design. So it was a big game changer to get an agency who knows what they're doing. But, um, yeah, like over the last year or two, uh, three years, maybe since we started working with Blackbird, the kind of visual aspect of the brand has really taken an upgrade. And that's really like, again, the best tip I can give is if your if your business looks really good, looks more professional, you know, it just kind of screams that you're doing a better job, even if it's not as big. Some Sometimes people think we're a lot bigger than we are. And maybe if we're in the US, we would be. We just look really, really professional. So if you have the have the, the money to invest in a good agency or a good branding or a design person, it's, it's worth it, really. Yeah. Unfortunately, we live in a world where perception is everything, good or yeah. bad, indifferent. You know, for you guys, it's, it's definitely working because it has that look and feel um, that the trust is just built kind of right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Now, being um, kind of naive to the European market in the UK, um, knowing about the GDPR and all of those and with your investment into email and SMS, as these privacy constraints have been put on the online marketplace, what have been some of the things that you guys have had to implement or pivot based on various new rules set in place? So one thing we had to do was on our sign-up flow, um, everybody's familiar with the fact that you're no longer allowed to have a pre-checked box. But actually what you're not allowed to do is to um, force people to to say yes in order to reach the next step of your sign-up flow. So essentially we were kind of forcing them to opt in and we actually we actually had to change that. Someone reached out to us from, an, from, a, from a government agency. And now what we do is if they try to continue on, the, on, our, on our email capture step, We'll say, hey, you're got, like instead of saying no, you can't continue unless you click this uh, checkbox. We have another pop up that comes up and says, hey, you're going to miss out on all our unbelievable deals. Are you sure you don't want to sign up? And then we have yes, no, and if they say yes or no, there, they can continue. So that was something that, yeah, we're. It was something that we, we definitely had to implement in order to comply, but we tried to still make it as as you know convert. And we're all marketers, right? We still wanted people to convert, so we tried to make it where this message was only pop up if they didn't fill out the checkbox and tried to continue. So we kind of had like one more, like, "Are you sure you don't want us to send you emails?" Mm-hmm. That was one thing that we did. Um, SMS, 
you just have to be careful with it. Um, it's that's kind of the most likely place you're going to have someone complain. And um, if you're sending them unsolicited SMS or you're 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 not you're not unsubscribing them when basically they've asked to be unsubscribed. So we would use SMS quite sparingly. It wouldn't be something that we would be doing regular blasts with. So they're the two they're the two big ones. And um, just making sure that you're when you're on, at the point of capture of the information that you obviously make them agree to your privacy policy, and then when you have that information, don't abuse it. Yeah, great advice. Uh, what was that phone call like? Getting it from the government agency? Uh, it was just an email, but it was, okay. <laughs> it was, yeah. Like I mean, it's look, you're always scared, pretty much, and you're always worried. And you know, thankfully, it was something where we we didn't we weren't really like we weren't doing it on purpose. It was just the way that actually it was being done by other people. But yeah, yeah we, obviously, once we knew it was something that we couldn't do, we just complied because we were essentially forcing someone to opt in in order to complete the checkout process, which is not allowed. So yeah. we stopped doing it. Obviously. Okay, interesting. Yeah, just we've had some clients who who started in the UK market, uh, US market, and then had shifted internationally, and there was the whole process of due diligence because the rules are just completely different um, in, in the two. In the U.S., I think is getting maybe a little bit better, but no one's sending emails from government agencies if you don't have a pop up on. I don't mm-hmm. see that, not at certain scale. Mm-hmm. Um, so you were talking a little bit in the beginning, and would love to dive deeper into this um, in terms of the model, the subscription based model. Um, how has that evolved? So you guys started out. You said, "Hey." We really want to mirror Butcher Box. It looks like they're crushing it. Um, what were those early days like in trying to figure out that model? And then how has it evolved over time? Well, look, similar with most e commerce companies and maybe companies in general in the beginning, the difficult part is getting customers. And, mm-hmm. you know, you, you really highly underestimate how difficult it is to convince someone to, to sign up for a subscription because. In general, if you're walking down the street and I ask you, do you want another subscription coming out of your account? The answer is always no. So we have to be very we have to be very clear in what we offer to our customers in terms of the benefits and why they should sign up, but also the offer that we we essentially give to them. Like if you go back to Sports Illustrated in the eighties, like the football phone and stuff, like it's all just about the offer. And then and we found that you have to become a very good direct response marketer um mm-hmm. for these type of businesses because if they it's pretty binary if then same with e commerce businesses, if they don't sign up, we didn't make any money. If they did sign up, we made money. So we're not really too focused on branding or we've tried a lot of PR and stuff like that. But really, our bread and butter is offers on Facebook, through email, and to get customers to, to, to sign up. So that is kind of what we learned the first five or six years in the business. I guess the last year or two um, has been more of um, maximizing the returns that you can generate from the customers that you do acquire. So, you know, that like we mentioned about um, using email to reactivate people in order to extend the lifetime value. We do a lot of add to box. So we would send we would essentially send out emails once a month and we would release new products that maybe have come in previous boxes that customers can add if they liked in the past. We also might do like an email. So pretty interesting tip that we do is we do what's called a reply yes email. So what we do is we might come up with, say, like a mystery box or uh, like a dog bed we have. And we'd say, hey, we have these in the warehouse. If you want to get this, simply reply yes, and we'll add it to your next box. And because we have their information already in our system, we can actually do a manual order and actually charge their card and ship it out to them, obviously with their consent. So that's something that works really well because it's really low barrier to entry for the customer. They mm-hmm. just reply to the email. Um, and yeah, like we just try and we try and make sure that we're keeping our customers as long as we can and making as much money off them and delivering as much value to them as we can. Right. Great, great suggestions, great tips. Uh, reply yes, that is a, a genius, simple uh, hack. Mm-hmm. That's a great idea that you guys have implemented. How many of these different offers have you guys tested, even over the last 24 months? You know, what are the ones, how do you quantify whether you have a winning offer or not? Well, you never know until you test, but some good ideas are, you know, think about like, would it get you up off your chair? Like, is it an unbelievable offer? Okay. So the the ones that worked really well, we had like a, a camera, like it's like a, a home security camera, but it was like, you could communicate with your dog when you're at work. That was really, really good. Our dog beds that we're running right now are really, really good. Like, I mean, it's, it's a free dog bed where it's something, some of them, the big size is worth 60 pounds and you get it for free yep. just for signing up for this subscription. Like, so pretty much a no brainer. Obviously, it's it's better and easier if you can find a product that has a high perceived value and doesn't cost you what it what it would cost you. That's why even like people that I'm coaching and stuff, I do a bit of consulting and stuff. It's like 
if you're if you're going to give a discount, you might be given twenty five euro or twenty five dollars or pounds, whatever currency off the off the product price. Whereas you could find a gift worth thirty or twenty five um, pounds, and then you can not, and then you don't have to give a discount. So the perceived value to the customer can be just as high, but it doesn't cost you as much. So um, that's something that we do. And yeah, like to be honest, offers can flop all the time. Something you think that's going to work really really well. You put it out and no one signs up. And unfortunately, you're wrong. Um, what we did find throughout the last couple of years as well, in the summertime, we do things like, you know, a splash pad for your dog, particularly if the weather gets really hot, which it always is, seems, in the summertime nowadays. But um, things to cool your dog down, like a cooling mat, splash pad, they were really, really good offers because they were relevant to what was going on. That's amazing. So you guys are able to understand your cost to get these free gifts and then you're able to give the perceived value that, hey, this is a, a $30, $40 uh, product. Mm-hmm. But you guys are getting it X amount of dollars from China. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, again, pardon my naiveness. Um, is the perception of the Chinese marketplace similar to that of the U.S. where it's, you know, it's working with China? How does that is there any correlation to that or how have you been able to get the manufacturing? Cause there are fantastic manufacturers over there. You just have to find them. Yeah. What has that process been like for you guys? Yeah. So funnily enough, we used to order up until this year, actually, we used to order through a UK reseller who we didn't have to worry too much about the quality and, and, and kind of even the cash flow implications. So Honestly, that one I'm not really sure just yet. We've just started to do it directly through China. So, but yeah, I'm aware obviously that you need to you need to be very clear on what you're on what you're getting. And we are going to take a trip out to China in September. There's there's the show, the CIPS show. I've been to China myself before, but not not on a business trip. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm not sure about that one just yet. Fair enough. Well, I wish you guys the best of luck. I for in our experience in my ecom brands. Alibaba is just a waste of time. You know, it's really having to identify the the solid manufacturers and then being so precise in what you're looking to get back um, and making sure there's some level of quality control and phases in product delivery and payments um, Mm -hmm. has also been really important. Uh, Going to China, from my understanding and the different people we work with, is probably your best bet. So. Yeah, it, it should be an interesting trip for you. Yeah, I mean, my co-founder Paul, he he did a lot of research into the best factories. We ordered samples, and again, like, kind of just got the impression that the the factory we ended up choosing was the best, and they seem to be, you know, sometimes you just know that they're the best. So that's kind of the best one we could find from Alibaba and online. But yeah, the plan is to go to China and 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 actually get someone direct out there. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. One of the things you can do, and just for our listeners, is there are ways of figuring out who uh, the manufacturers for different brands are. If you look at different uh, legal documents that you can find mm-hmm. online, and then you can piggyback their manufacturers and identify exactly where they're getting them made. And then at least then it helps to build that trust up that at least you're getting good products because these people sell them. Mm-hmm. So for Buster Box, um, knowing eight years now, um, you've talked about the acquisition a few times. Um, when you guys started this business, was it to sell or was it more of, hey, we want to support our families. We want to do something we enjoy together based on being three good friends. What what did that look like? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess you probably thought you were going to be a lot more successful, a lot faster than we were. Probably the same for everybody, but um, yeah, I think in the end it was always a business to sell. Um, but yeah, if you can do the other thing in the meantime and get paid from it and have a, have a pretty decent life now that things are a bit more you know up and running and outsourced, then then yeah. So, but yeah, it's kind of been something that we always wanted to sell. That's awesome. It's interesting. Some people I spoke with someone last week who was like, I don't want to sell this. I want to build something for my family. He's doing eight million dollars plus a year. Um, we have clients even that are like, Hey, we want to sell in two years. You know, so it's just an interesting, mm-hmm. uh, and I think everybody's goals always change. I mean, for us as well, like we know that the subscription box industry hasn't been around for a hundred years, so it might not be around in a hundred years. So you know, that's kind of also in the back of our mind is that, um, yeah, like if we could get out with a good price uh, for the business, uh, kind of we're in our early thirties now and kind of coming to the time where you know maybe a change wouldn't be too bad. Maybe you can start something else with the funds from that. 
Um, I would look at something probably in software or something with a slightly higher ceiling. So yeah, that's just kind of where we are. That's awesome. So as we're wrapping up the show, um, what would be kind of your biggest advice or tip that you would give to brands looking to kind of scale, you know, get to closer to your, your revenue mark, um, coming from that sub million dollar annual revenue? Honestly, I can only give what, what works for us and that's to come up with a really, really good offer. Make sure you're lever- leveraging email as much as possible. And when you discover the offer, you'll usually know because you'll probably be getting more customers in a week than you used to get in a month. And then just go hard, go as hard as you That's can. Awesome. When you, because because things, you can lose momentum very quickly and things can be working really, really well. And the one thing we did do well in the last few years was, as I mentioned, during COVID, we just put the foot down. We just said, this ain't yeah. going to be like this forever. And for three or four months, as I said, we just spent as much as we could spend on Facebook and grew the business to the size that it was and, and kind of it's kind of really maintained in and around that level now it's grown a bit more but yeah come up with an offer that works and um, email is going to be very important to make sure that you're maximizing the return on your ad spend and yeah just if you can get it work and just go yeah a- a- amazing advice i think everybody also has to always keep in mind is the budget conversation once you find those winners you have to spend more it's not like facebook will continue to optimize and reduce your customer acquisition costs it doesn't work like that Just make sure to scale the ads when you find those winners mm-hmm. so gary what is the plan for buster box um over the next 12 to 24 months what are you and your team looking to achieve uh, before we wrap the show up um first things first we started to make our orders directly to china which means we're cutting out middlemen so it's maximizing our profitability um and really focus on profitability right now while things are the way they are i think as i said before we're probably probably give, give, not giving ourselves enough credit to go from losing money for a lot of the time because we were taking an investment to last year turning a profit just by simply uh, kind of pulling back and clearing out some costs so really we're focusing on profitability right now because we don't know when the next investment round is going to come and even if it does come like the, the more profitable you can show that you are the better valuation you're going to get whether that's an acquisition or a sale so that's pretty much our focus right now we're not going to be going crazy into into growth of the top line revenue it's more just maximizing that bottom line um and then yeah just just kind of continuing to do that for the, the toys as i said and the products we're ordering from china has just kind of started we haven't even received the first order yet but it is a significantly uh, better margin for us then when you have that margin also it kind of opens up different possibilities because you have more free cash flow because the one thing that we're good at is generating cash flow because we have customers on subscriptions we're strong with our offers we're strong with our marketing so we kind of always have the money coming in our problem is number one churn and number two actually actually margin so if we can if we can play around with our pricing and keep our churn in line and um, then we could look to scale towards the end of this year maybe next scale up a bit more Amazing. Well, I wish you guys all the best in that. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. I think the knowledge, the information you've you've discussed today is, is so valuable. I really appreciate your time with all of this. Thank you. Had a really good time. Great to chat to you. So if you have any if there's anyone listening in the UK and in Ireland, where can we find you? Where can people follow along to to keep watching the journey of Busterbox? Yeah, well, BusterBox.com is the website. Uh, I'm at GaryRebin.com. I have a Facebook group called Subscription Box Success if people are looking to get into that industry. Uh, And yeah, my email is Gary at GaryRebin.com as well. Awesome. So if anybody's in the subscription box business looking for some advice, reach out to Gary. Um, Obviously, you know what you're doing. So we will leave links to all of those in the description and the show notes. Uh, Gary, again, thank you very much for coming on today. Thank you. Pleasure.